Hi everybody, welcome to today's video where I'm going to give you a simple overview of the key differences between qualitative, quantitative and mixed methods research, which will be linked to practical application and some example research studies too. So this video should be helpful for any healthcare students when you're critiquing papers, um, starting research modules or dissertations, as well as the differences between the different types of research approaches. I'll also present the data collection methods and data analysis methods relating to each, and some of the critical appraisal checklists that you can use to appraise and critique um, published papers relating to qualitative, quantitative or mixed methods research studies. When you do dissertations, you'll need to reference the critical appraisal checklist that you use. So I've included some key references and resources too. So I hope you find this video helpful. So if any of you are healthcare students, I've also got some helpful videos that are free on my YouTube channel to help develop critical writing, critical analysis in essays, how to write in third person and citations and referencing where I give examples of in-text citations and paraphrasing that might help some of you. So I'm going to start with quantitative research approach and as healthcare students you're going to see that your evidence base is dominated by the opposite which is qualitative research. We have a lot more papers on patients perceptions or patients or staff perceptions, experiences, we have interpretive and exploratory research dominating our fields. However, I think it's important as healthcare professionals that you have an overview and understanding of quantitative research. I've just done a mixed methods research PhD myself where I integrated qualitative and quantitative research. So it's important that we understand those numbers and statistics or have a basic understanding. Um, so with quantitative research, the type of data you focus on is linked to numbers and statistics, and the purpose is to test hypothesis. So this type of research is objective and deductive, as the researcher starts with a theory or hypothesis. So it's not exploratory where you're trying to gain understanding and insights like qualitative. You start with a theory or hypothesis or view, and then you test it by collecting quantitative data, numerical data. And you're aiming to predict and measure differences between groups Groups and examine relationships. So research questions might look at how often, um, how much, what is the relationship between A and B, cause and effect relationships. You're testing that idea or an explanation of something to prove, disprove and inform um, the research in that area and you're using numbers to do that. So later on I'll present a, a research study from Griffiths et al that examined the relationship between staffing levels of registered nurses and nursing assistants and hospital mortality using quantitative data as an example. So if we look at some example quantitative research methods you can use surveys where you're using numbers only. Obviously, we also have open-ended questions in surveys. That would be qualitative data because it's open narrative that you're going to have to interpret. But when you use numbers on surveys and questionnaires, you can use numer numerical rating scales, for example. So an example might be a student satisfaction survey um, establishing how satisfied students are feel in placement. And students might rate the satisfaction they feel on a scale of one to 10. And then researchers can complete a statistical analysis using that numerical data and establish an average rating of satisfaction um, and how students felt on placement as one whole data set. Um, other quantitative research methods include experiments and observations to test hypothesis and to predict change or difference. So for example, um, an experiment, you introduce an intervention or a treatment, you've got a control group and there has to be randomization in an experiment. So for example, drug clinical trials where people are the um, test subjects and uh, randomized control trials. Observations, again, observations you might collect quantitative or qualitative data. It depends on whether you're using numbers, you're measuring numbers, or whether you are observing in, say, for example, an ethnographic study where you're sitting at the bedside watching what nurses and patients do, and you're writing down what they do from your perspective, and you code that data and interpret it. But you can also use observations using quantitative research methods where you measure what you observe using numbers. So, for example, you could time um, nurse patient interactions. You might measure the duration of time that nurses spend using a computer during a 12 hour shift. That's quantifiable numerical data.
So if we look at quantitative data analysis and how we analyse those numbers, I'm going to give a really simple overview. I am not a statistician. It is not my forte. Maths is not my forte. But I've got a basic understanding that I'm going to impart to you. There's two statistical methods used. You can use descriptive statistics or inferential statistics. So what are descriptive statistics? Well, you need mathematics um, to use descriptive statistics. And I use descriptive statistics in my PhD and I am not good at maths. I'm horrendous at maths. So my husband is a physics, good at physics. Um, he double checked numbers, but I could also in universities, you're going to have statisticians. You can have uh, people to double check. You can use Excel spreadsheets as well, as well that will do the maths for you. But with descriptive statistics, you describe the key characteristics of a quantitative data set. Um, and you can use percentages, the mean, average, median, mode and standard deviation. And I had to look up what some of these things were myself because I had been out of maths for a long time. But the median is the midpoint of a range of numbers placed in numerical order. So if the data set, if you start at the bottom up to the top and you've got an odd number, um, it will be bang in the middle. The mode is the most commonly occurring number. The standard deviation metric shows you how dispersed a set of numbers are. So basically how near or far away the numbers are from your average. So the standard deviation will be high if you've got a real range of numbers that deviate away from your average. The standard deviation will be low if they're close together and near to the average. So when you use descriptive statistics, you do not make predictions or conclusions about a whole population you're focused on the data set. So in comparison to descriptive statistics where you can't make generalizations about a whole population, inf inferential statistics you can. You can make inferences and predictions about a population. Inferential statistics help to predict changes or differences between different groups and establish relationships between variables and I'll give some examples. So an example nursing research study that uses both descriptive statistics and inferential statistics, if for example, is from Bridges et al. 2019. And the researchers examine hospital nurse staffing and staff patient interactions in an observational study. The researchers use descriptive statistics to describe nurse patient interactions. For example, 10% of the 376 observed interactions were rated as negative. Patients were aged between 18 and 101 years with a mean of 82 years. So they're using an average and a mean to describe those statistics. Inferential statistics are also used and they use what's called a logistic regression model, which I'll talk about later, to investigate the impact of staffing levels on the chance of nurse patient interactions being rated negatively. So they're looking at relationships between staffing levels and the quality of nurse patient interactions. So the study made inferences between those variables that could be generalised to the population. And they concluded that the odds of a negative nurse patient interaction increased significantly as the number of patients per RN increased. So the more patients you look after, the more chance there is of the, of the quality of the nurse patient interaction going down. And they use a statistical calculation linked to probability that's detailed in the paper that's quite complex. So um, I won't present that as well. Another example study from Griffiths et al. 2009 entitled Nurse Staffing, Nurse Assistance and Hospital Mortality. This was a retrospective longitudinal cohort study present inferential statistics. And the study explored the relationship between patient outcomes such as mortality and variations in nurse staffing. So the inferential statistics um, that were presented showed that the hazard of death was increased by 3% for every day a patient experienced registered nurse staffing below a ward mean. Um, with calculations there. And then relative to ward mean, each additional hour of registered nurse care available over the first five days of a patient's stay was associated with a 3% reduction in the hazard of death. So inferences were made by the researchers to the whole population and it was concluded that lower registered nurse staffing and higher levels of admissions per registered nurse are associated with an increased risk of death during an admission to hospital. So some real powerful data there.
So the two nursing studies I just presented use a regression model to analyse quantitative data. And there's different quantitative methods you can use to analyse data. So, for example, and it's helpful to know just what they mean, at least when you review and critique papers. So t-tests compare the averages between two groups of data. ANOVA analysis of variance is similar to a t-test, but it compares the mean between groups. So it's more than two groups. Correlation analysis assesses the relationships between two variables and regression analysis that was used in those papers that I've just presented. Similar to correlation analysis, but it use, it's used to assess the relationship between variables and it goes a step further to understand cause and effect, so which you could see in Bridges and Griffiths' studies. So if you move to qualitative research now, the type of data you collect will not be numbers like quantitative. It may be narrative, words, videos or sounds. It depends on your research study. The purpose of qualitative research is to describe, explore and understand. So it's subjective and it's inductive approach. Qualitative data, for example, explores people's perceptions, feelings, experiences. So in instead of testing a hypothesis or theory, you're formulating a hypothesis. You're developing a theory, a concept, an idea from the data. So, for example, if you um, uh, take some narrative data from observations, you're having to code, theme, analyse that data, and it will formulate a concept, an idea and themes. When we look at some example qualitative research methods, you could use narrative transcripts from interviews or observations that you've done. They could be audio recorded or videoed, or you could be a researcher sitting there taking notes. Surveys using open ended questions, so no numbers, any work linked to the arts, images, videos, poetry. Um, the focus is on descriptions, concepts and ideas. And as long as there's no numbers, um, it can be linked to qualitative research methods. So moving to qualitative data analysis, I think there's a myth that qualitative data analysis is easier and less time consuming than quantitative. And I say this as someone that's just completed a P mixed methods PhD study. Um, it is time consuming. Um, so some of the methods you might see are content analysis in papers where you evaluate patterns between words, phrases and images. You've got narrative analysis where you listen to a person's story to gain insights into their situation. So, for example, listening to staff or patient stories. Um, discourse analysis is where you analyse language in a social context, uh, the conversation and the speech that's taking place within a culture. Um, so you could do a discourse analysis between consultants and junior doctors on a ward round, for example, using audio recordings or videos. Um, then we've got thematic analysis and descriptive thematic analysis focuses on the generation of themes from a data subset. And this is data set, which is what I used in my PhD. Um, Braun and Clark is the analytical method I used. And I have got the references for all the references used in this um, video are all in a reference list at the end. So Braun and Clark have six phases to help that process of thematic analysis. We also have a third research approach called mixed methods research and mixed methods research combines qualitative and quantitative research methods to better understand a complex research problem or uh, question. Um, and you might start with quantitative data collection and then do qualitative or vice versa. Um, and it provides a multifaceted view in relation to a complex research question. So I wanted to explore the quality of nurse patient interactions when nurses used EPR on acute care wards. So I chose a mixed methods research um, design as my research question and the area of interest was multifaceted. And using this um, research method, you have multiple perspectives that can inform each other and validate findings. But a criticism of this approach is that you may not get enough in-depth analysis and the data still needs to be integrated and analysed, which can be difficult because you're fitting together numbers and narrative, for example. So you need to have really clearly aligned research questions. If you're interested in mixed method research or you're reviewing articles with mixed me method study designs, Creswell and Piano 2017 have got a good paper that describes the different ways you can do this. Um, there's convergent design where you have qualitative and quantitative studies take place simultaneously. 
explanatory sequential design where quantitative study is undertaken first, then subsequent qualitative study is conducted to explore, explain the findings of your quantitative data, and then exploratory se sequential design where the qualitative study is undertaken first, and then the subsequent quantitative study is conducted to confirm or establish the commonality of issues from your qualitative data. When using a mixed methods research design, there needs to be synthesizing of the data. So it needs to be brought together and integrated to inform the overall study findings and themes. I know Catherine Murphy and Nichols wrote a really good paper, it's open access, describing three techniques for integrating data in mixed method studies. Again, the reference is at the end. And triangulating and producing a converging coding matrix, for example, is in there to display key findings from each data set. And that's um, something that I used in my PhD study. So having gone through qualitative, quantitative and mixed methods research, if any of you are doing a thesis, you will need to critically appraise published studies and papers. And I thought it would be helpful to give a simple overview of critical appraisal tools and checklists. Um, so Critical appraisal tools checklists enable researchers to systematically assess the relevance, trustworthiness of a published paper and the research study findings and results. So there's a range of different critical appraisal tools for quantitative, qualitative and mixed method studies. And you need to use the correct type of checklist for the type of study that you're critiquing and appraising. In a dissertation thesis, you'll also need to include the reference of appraisal checklist that you've used and you usually present a table in, uh, in literature reviews, for example, that summarise your appraisal of key research studies and you've got key headings linked to the checklist in your tables. So the first resource I suggest you use is the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme website under the heading CASP Checklist. This is an internationally renowned resource and website for researchers and it includes helpful critical appraisal checklists that you can download for free. And it includes um, checklists for systematic reviews, qualitative studies, randomised control trials, cohort studies, case control studies, diagnostic studies and economic evaluation studies. I'd also recommend the Mixed Methods Appraisal Tool, MMAT, from Hong et al. 2018. Um, this is one that I used in my Mixed Methods PhD study. Um, MMAT is a critical appraisal tool that allows you to appraise the quality of five categories of studies, qualitative research, randomised controlled trials, non-randomised studies, quantitative descriptive studies and mixed method studies. And there are also other appraisal checklists out there, but I would start with those ones that I've just presented. So I hope you found this video helpful. Do check out my other videos. I've got lots of videos on quality improvement. If you've got quality improvement projects, reflective essays, um, etc. So do check them out. They're all free on my YouTube channel. And finally, I'm just going to go through some of the references. So I'll go quite slow because um, sometimes you can't read them if I go too quickly. And that's the next one. So I hope you found it helpful today. If you've got any questions at all, put them in the YouTube comments or you can DM me privately on Twitter. Um, do check out my website. And I've also got two books if you're interested to help with nurses career development, how to thrive as a newly registered nurse. And then another book on how to prepare for interviews and develop your career as a nurse or midwife.